this land. It is called Nandar, Nandi for three. Ah, so this, as you can see, is similar. So he compared it to the Nandi for three. And so, you see, this particular temple was not only admired by all, but also poets wrote about it at that time. Not, I'm not saying later or anything. Contemporary poets wrote about it. They extolled it. They praised it. And it was something of a marvel or a wonder even in those, I mean, certainly in those days. Next. And now, as you go, this is now the priests are sitting here. As you exit, you see this and you feel a certain sublime quality. After having seen everything, being excited by the sculptures, being uh, admired the temple, admired the architecture, as you go, the sort of cool quality, the sublime quality, the quietness, the aloofness, of the architecture. You know, it doesn't it doesn't grip you. Like in a Hindu temple, it's all dark, and you feel part of that uh, being with the divinity and everyone around. Here it's open, and it's colonnaded, and there's light, and white marble, and it's cool, but it's aloof. And that, in a way, reflects the Jain ethos of self-restraint, of not being involved, of withdrawing within yourself, and contemplation and meditation being more important. So while after the initial excitement, the, the temple leaves a, a, a feeling of being sort of by yourself, isolated in a wonderful atmosphere. Experience is very different. Next. And we come again to this figure as we exit. But what, what we saw at that time was just the figure. I did not show you the panels around it. And there are wonderful panels of a hunter here. You can see him with a deer. But what I want to draw attention to you is this particular panel. And that panel shows you erotic scenes. Now you would think in a, kind of, in a religion like Jainism, which is in constant denial of sensual pleasures. Why would they have a panel showing sexual poses and also bestiality with animal and you know, animal sex? And the reason for that is that it serves a function of auspiciousness. Now, why that is the case, please don't ask me, because I am not able to explain it, but maybe Jitubhai or Dr. Tripathi might be able to explain it. But it also plays an atropaic function, which means it is nazar nalagi. You know, it is to ward off hunger. So these panels are uh, put there. And the, the way that Jains have cleverly introduced it is, it is a panel on the story or the legend of Sturibhadra. Now, Sturibhadra was a young prince who was, uh, who was completely um, involved in sexual and sensual pleasures and enjoying himself. He lived in the house of a courtesan and he was there, there most of the time. And one day, he just felt enough. And he left and he became a monk. <coughs> And then the next, a few years, or the next two years after that, when the monsoon season comes, when all the monks are supposed to wander and go to places where they can become recluses and they meditate more during the monsoon season, rainy season. When his teacher asked him, what are you planning to do? He said, I'm going back to Osha, the courtesan's house. And everyone was shocked. He said, I'm going there to show you my self-restraint. And he went there, and he stayed there for the whole season. And Kosha was, of course, delighted, but her charms had no effect on him. He was completely occupied in his meditation. And whatever was going around him didn't affect him. And he was able to prove that he could have self-restraint of that sort. 
So this story is explained here, and this gives him enough reason to show those sexual poses and all, because it's really the story of Sturi Brother. They are not making it up. So this is the story. Next, please. Yeah, you can see this. has a specific function that it performs. Next. And so now we see this step two. You been inside, you come out, and you see now you can see these shines. There are 72 of them for all the three, 24 uh, uh, pit members of the cosmic cycle. All these are shines with their own individual spire. That's the lofty uh, foundation. The main spire. This is the uh, hall, the ceilings where we saw all these people in And I want to draw your attention to this circle of This one. When the armies of Aurangzeb were marching southwards towards the Deccan to conquer the Deccan, his armies desecrated the temple. They broke everything, they you know, ruined it, and they left. So the Jains got together and they decided how do we avoid something like this happening again. And then they built these little round things and they erected minars on it. So from afar it would look like a masjid. And these, then the army, as it is, it was a hilly area. As it was, if you couldn't see it very clearly, you just saw four minars or tops of it. They never came there again and they went away. Yet, this ruse didn't help, uh, help because the uh, temple crumbled in any case and it fell into ruins. And the reason for that was that the area suffered a lot of famine, successive years of famine. People moved away. The river dried down. All the trees and all, it all started becoming barren. People just moved away. And when they moved away, the temple was overgrown with vegetation. And then snakes and reptiles and wild animals from the forests behind all made it their, their home. And more than that, it became a hideout for decoits and thieves. And for 200 years, it lay like that. 100 to 150 years, something but a longish period. And of course, because it was neglected, it, was, it began to fall into ruins, you know, the uh, pillars crumbled, the ceilings fell down, and all sorts of things happened. At around the end of the 18th, 19th century, sometime around 1880s or so, um, Sangapati Hemabhai Hachi Singh of Andhava came with a group of pilgrims. And when he wanted to go and visit the temple, and then he was told he couldn't go because it was unsafe, totally unsafe. So he's decided that this can't go on. The first thing he did was he got the temple clear. He hired, interestingly, Arab guards to guard the temple. Also, the way from the nearest town, which is about eight miles away, a place called Sabri, eight or 10 miles away, he had the entire road with guards there. And then he just, got the temple cleaned and somewhat repaired. So it became a place where people could go again. Then in 1897, it was taken over by uh, the, this Anandji Pradhi, Pradhi, Anandji Kalyanji Pradhi, who decided that they would take it. It's, a, it's an organization, and that looks after the conservation and renovation and repairs of temples looks after um, the Jain um, manuscript libraries and everything like that. So there, they took charge of it. And in 1933, that is almost 30 years later, 36 years later, the repairs started. And the repairs are still going on. You can go there and you can hear chiseling happening and there are these sculptors sculpting away. And 
hold it. When you talk to them, you, you are so moved by their story because the sculptors are the 14th generation of the sculptors who originally built the temple. The pujaris are, who were, the main pujari who was brought when the temple was first consecrated, he, was, he came from Chittor. And his 14th generation are the pujaris there. And the 14th generation of Ratnasa, the brother of Ratnasa, they live in Sabri. They have the right to put the, put the flag on the temple spire. So you have the sculptors, the pujaris, and the patrons all reconnected to the temple. And that's, and every evening there are no electric lights in. Every evening when you go, there's the most beautiful arti with little lamps, these pujaris singing, and they have two huge drums there, huge kettle drums. And they're beating them, and then they tell you, that one is a male drum, the other is a female drum because of their pitch and their tone. So you hear this in the candlelight and uh, the lamplight and you hear the puja and it's again a divine experience of a different type. It's not an intellectual experience of appreciating the beauty of a temple. It is a spiritual experience of having been somewhere where there is a lot of piety and devotion. Next one. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your patience. I want to particularly thank you all for your patience for having waited and hopefully I was able to interest you in this talk. Thank you. <laughs>
I mean, there was not a set of craftsmen that only worked for the Muslims or only worked for the Jains or the Hindus. So they had um, acquired mastery over all these motifs. And as long as these motifs did not specify any religious symbolism, they could be used everywhere. Yes? Good evening. Um, you have shown this motif of five bodies and one uh, head. Yes. And that is something very similar, well, not inspired or at least connected to what you find in uh, Sicily, where you have one head and three legs, which is a very old Tyrrhenian motif which is a symbol of Sicily and also, of course, Italy. And could you, you know explain? what? Uh, I think this is probably the sort of lineage that you see in places like Ajanta and all. You have one head of a deer and four bodies. So that, I think it's more that, that sort of descending from that <coughs> thought process and concept. Okay, Sicily. Yes. You know, that temple is a replica of some of them. And in Samosan, it's a layered, you know, structure, uh, architecture, you know, depending on the level of people. So that the closest to the Kinsankara are the mountains. Now in this temple also, since it is a replica, the layers as we see in the carving, are they repre representing the layer or they are just arbitrary? The well, more or less, from what you, do, uh, you are saying, I also try to see that. And what I feel is that in the floor plan, they have made three distinct areas. And when you go there, you find one is raised this much, the other is raised this much. I mean, it can't, it's not actually exactly like a Samasaran, it's conceptually like a Metaphorical. Yeah, metaphorical. I was just thinking, you know, the dance was the court is not really like that. And the monk, maybe they were like representing you know, reserved, undeserved common people, like in some of No, I, at least I didn't see that, uh, or I was not able to grasp that when I saw the temple if it was there. But it is, I've been there two, three times, and the last time I was there, I must tell you what was interesting was it was 50 degrees centigrade outside. And I had to go there because I was writing a book on Ramapur and, you know, the deadlines are coming near and we had to go. Inside the temple it was 10 degrees less because of the marble and the airiness of the area. Mm. It was 10 degrees less. But I'm very happy to have sort of talked about a thing, a, a temple that has completely interested me and uh, I have been fascinated by it and if I have been able to share some enthusiasm with all of you, I'm very happy. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Do you belong to join philosophy, join spirituality or I am more in the art area, not in the philosophy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanguji. I hope you all agree with me that Thank it was a very fascinating and engrossing lecture on an architectural wonder in marble. About such temples, it has been said by art historians that the people they started like gigants bringing boulders from all around. Usually, these temples, where they stand, they don't have that sort of a stone with which they are built. And they finish like goldsmiths. So this is so fine. The carving is so fine. Then they start they, they, and they finish as goldsmiths. So, uh, well, I think yes, everybody is impatient about. I, I would first request uh, our Chairman uh, 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 Bhogilalji would like to say something and a word of thanks you would like to give to Sariuji and to the audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm 
It's my privilege to say a few words uh, of appreciation to Sharivan for being with us this evening and giving us a wonderful exposition uh, on Ranakpur. Uh, I've been to Ranakpur as a little boy, young boy, uh, not particularly religious. I was dragged over there by my parents and grandparents. And I must say that I'm looking at Ranakpur in a completely different uh, manner uh, after uh, this evening's talk. And I think we probably uh, should go and visit it once more and see it in a, in a different light, but not when it's 50 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Shariban is the second time that I've heard her. We had a group of uh, friends who came from different parts of the world to India. And uh, as was the custom, the host had to uh, give a talk or get somebody to talk on his religion. And both Sheila and I had the privilege of asking Sharif 